Good morning. Welcome to Zion this morning. Let everybody get settled here. Um, I've been worship leader a few times before, but I was thinking this week as I was preparing, I think this might be my first time not exclusively on Zoom or outside. So I feel like we're making progress. <laughs> but I was feeling kind of nervous this week, and Ron had this brilliant suggestion that I set a timer for two minutes of silence, like Frank did last week, and just call it good. And I don't even think Frank's here to get the joke, but anyway, sometimes not having um, or what we've taken for granted in the past really makes it a, us appreciate it more. So welcome, I'm glad you're here. And for those on Zoom, welcome as well. A little call out to Daphne, who I think is joining us too. So um, if anyone has any announcements this morning, now is the time for that. Come on up. This is the weekend that we traditionally have the Drift Creek Annual Meeting. Um, we had to cancel it last year. We're having to not do it in person again this year, but there's a Zoom meeting today at 4 o'clock. If you're interested, um, please email info at driftcreek.org to get the link to join the Zoom meeting. Thanks. Um, well, it's that time of the year again for collecting turkeys for the Jubilee Food Pantry. We are doing our 12th annual turkey drive on November 16th, but the collection times are November 15th and the 16th until 4 o'clock. So we do not have enough freezer space or refrigeration space to house 100 and some turkeys like we did last year. We did, I mean, not, we didn't, ref, we didn't, anyways, we don't have enough space, so that's the only time that we're allowing turkeys to come to our house. So I do have some hard copies. We're going to send out um, the flyer and the announcement through the, for the bulletin for next Sunday also. Um, but keep it in mind, if you want a hard copy, please come and get it from me. Um, also, if you like our Jubilee Food Pantry page on Facebook, if you happen to be a Facebook person, um, I post regular updates and um, just let things, let people know what's going on. So, um, yeah, it's another year. So, Recently, I was in a conversation about why we go to church. Um, I tried to explain the difference to me between religion and faith. I admitted that this thing we participate in Sundays, if it was about religion, I probably wouldn't be here. I probably would have left it a while ago. Um, but Sunday morning for me is about faith, trust, and community. Faith isn't tied to power or political gain. No one can force faith on me. No one can take it away from me. It's about a personal relationship with my creator, with creation, and my community. It's definitely not certain. I've got lots of questions, and I wrestle with the disorder and the messiness of this life. Frank mentioned last Sunday that we come in through those doors carrying a lot of different baggage and was just wishing that we could leave that baggage at the door. We have different lived experiences, different pain and suffering, fears, pasts, temptations, worries, doubts. Maybe you've been hurt by the church. Maybe you're searching. Maybe you're hung up on guilt. Maybe you look forward to this time of collective worship and maybe you don't want to be here. We're messy. Wouldn't it be nice just to leave all that at the door? But faith to me, unlike religion, can feel welcomes all that messy in. It invites it in the door, all of it, and it trusts that we're loved just as we are. Not because we've got it, we are as we should be, or have got it all figured out. We're not, none of us are. Um, but because as the former contemporary Christian singer-songwriter, Rich Mullins said, God loves everybody. It don't make me special. It just proves God ain't got no taste. And I don't think he does. 
And thank God. I think God takes the messiness in our lives and he makes the most beautiful art in the world out of it. If you are half as cultured as Christians wish you were, you'd be useless to Christianity. But God is a wild man, and I hope that someday you have the chance to encounter him. But if you do, let me warn you, because you better hold on, or better, let go for dear life. I actually um, wrote down more than one quote from the film about the life and legacy of Rich Mullins called A Ragamuffin's Legacy. I highly recommend it. And if you didn't listen to lots of contemporary Christian music on cassette tapes, in the 80s and early 90s and don't know who he is. He's well known for his worship songs like Awesome God and Sometimes by Step, which I see Stan is gonna lead us in a couple of those this morning. But Rich wrestled his entire life with crippling insecurities, alcohol, depression, and more. He had a lot of baggage and yet a deep faith and he rose to fame through his music until he gave it all up to live on an American Indian reservation, teaching kids music and about the hope that he found in Jesus. He also said, church is the one place in the world we should be able to go and not be ashamed. He challenged the norms of what it means to be a follower of Jesus, and I love that. He unfortunately, tragically died in a car accident in 1997. But as a call to worship this morning, I invite you to join me in prayer. But let's pray trusting the firm foundation that this community is built on can hold all the baggage. Let's pray with a willingness to let go for dear life and let go of those things that hold us captive and hold us back. Let's thank God we are created in his image and for the beauty he can make of our messiness. Let's pray that we can reflect God's love in our care of each other and of the creation that we've been entrusted with. So let's pray. We thank you, God, that you know what it is to be human, fragile and vulnerable, searching for ways to live in dangerous and complicated times. We confess that we have at times brought darkness into the world by our anger, our selfishness, our violence, our destruction of creation. We thank you that you know the struggles and temptations of living in darkness. We confess that sometimes we are skeptical of light and it's easier to stay in the shadows where things can stay hidden, where people can't see our cracks and flaws. Cast your light on our darkness and forgive us, God of love. We thank you that you give light to the world and welcome us as we are. Lord, help us to keep our feet moving, our hands outstretched and our hearts open to you. Keep us from temptation and help us to do your work in the world. From all that is broken, let there be beauty. From what is torn, jagged, ripped, and frayed, let there not just be mending, but meetings unimagined. May the God in whom nothing is lost or wasted gather every scrap, every shred and shard, and make of them new pathways, doorways, and wild, beautiful worlds. Amen. Now is the time for our offering, which is still being collected at the back of the sanctuary, but I will do a little prayer just for the offering now. So let's pray again. <laughs> God of all creation, thank you for the wonderful things you have made. Thank you for the universe full of stars and planets. Thank you for our world full of life. Thank you for making each one of us. Thank you for loving each one of us. Take these gifts we now offer back to you. May they be used in the glory to the glory of your name. We offer you ourselves and all the gifts you have blessed us with. Take us and use us to share your love with the world. Amen. Now we can take a moment to stand and greet one another with the passing of the peace. And then I think Stan will lead us in some music.
before we do some singing this morning, there's one more announcement that needs to be made. We kind of missed the announcements because we were out. We are superintendents, or no, are we superintendents? What are we called? Yeah. <laughs> uh, for the children's department, and we were busy. If you would like to see activity sometimes, just poke your head into the gym where all of our um, Sunday school classes are meeting right now. And so we came up a little bit late, but we do have an important announcement here. So we are in need of someone to job share with Gina for grades one and two, which are six and seven year olds. Usually there's about four boys in that class. And I really like Gina's, I'm sorry, Gina's. <laughs> Here is a um, note about meetings unimagined. So Karen and I just prayed this morning that uh, God is working in some hearts um, to prepare you for meetings unimagined um, with some um, six and seven year old boys. There are 32 and people on. We have a curriculum. And that's why so it was there's no people or very typing up the voice. Required. Uh, just come from nine to 10. We can and I can't turn it any louder on mine. Teach and uh, Gina is willing to do a lot of the Sundays. She's already started the school year. So if this is something that interests you, we are giving you the opportunity to pray about it and let us know. And um, if there are five or six of you that come and say, we want to do that, we'll work with you. <laughs> and you can tell we work together with our yep. teachers. We really dressed alike this morning. The first song that we're going to sing this morning is To God Be the Glory, number 84 in the Voices Together book. So uh, if you'd open up your books to 84, um, I'm gonna ask you to stand. Sometimes people wonder, why do we stand when we sing? I've been told by choir people that we sing better if we stand. But there's also something to me that's kind of unifying, I think, about standing together, especially a song like this that we sing, To God Be the Glory. I don't know, it just seems like we ought to be standing. So I invite you guys here, if you can, to stand. Those of you at home, I challenge you to stand too. Tell me if you do it. To God be the glory. To God be the glory, great things he hath done. So loved he the world that he gave us his son, who yielded his life in atonement for sin and opened the life gate that all may go in. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the earth hear his voice. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the people rejoice. Oh, come to the Father through Jesus the Son and give him the glory, great things he hath done. Oh, perfect redemption, the purchase of blood to every believer, the promise of God, the vilest offender who truly that moment from Jesus, a pardon received. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the earth hear his voice. Praise the Lord. 
You may be seated, but turn in the same hymnal to number 365. Three hundred sixty-five. We'll sing through this twice. Lord, I lift your name on high. Lord, I love to sing your praises. I'm so glad you're in my life. I'm so glad you came to save us. You came from heaven to earth to show the way. From the earth to the cross, my debt to pay. From the cross to the grave, from the grave to the sky. Lord, I lift your name on high. Lord, I lift your name on high. Lord, I love to sing your praises. I'm so glad you're in my life. I'm so glad you came to save us. You came from heaven to earth to show the way. From the earth to the cross, my debt to pay. From the cross to the grave, from the grave to the sky. Lord, I lift your name on high. Um, the next two songs that we're going to sing are Rich Mullen songs that he wrote. Um, yeah, this, this first one, Our God is an Awesome God. We're just going to sing the chorus. <laughs> I was tempted to do the verses. Here's what the verses say. When he rolls up his sleeves, he ain't just putting on the ritz. Our God is an awesome God. There's thunder in his footsteps and lightning in his fists. Our God is an awesome God. The Lord wasn't joking when he kicked him out of Eden. It wasn't for no reason that he shed his blood. His return is very soon, so you better be believing that our God is an awesome God. That's one of the verses, but we're just going to sing the chorus two times. Our God is an awesome God. He reigns from heaven above with wisdom, power, and love. Our God is an awesome God. Our God is an awesome God. He reigns from heaven above with wisdom, power, and love. Our God is an awesome God. And another one by Rich Mullins. Oh God, you are my God. Step by step. Oh God, you are my God. And I will ever praise you. seek you in the morning. I will learn to walk in your ways. And step by step you'll lead me. And I will follow you all of my days. Oh God, you are my God. And I will ever praise you. seek you in the morning. I will learn to walk in your ways. And step by step you'll lead me. And I will follow you all of my days. And I will follow you all of my days. And I will follow you all of my days. And step by step
everybody's making their way up. Oh, who did you bring up with you today? Oh, Liam. Come on up, everybody come up. We're going to read a story, so we want to make sure you can see the pictures. I have a question for you guys. Does anybody remember the name of the guy that Steve and Dylan talked to you about last week? His name was Francis, and they got to share part of his story with you last week, and I decided that we would finish that story today so we can finish talking about Francis. And just a reminder, Francis was born in a town a long way away from here called Assisi in a place called Italy. It's very far from us. But the reason we want to learn about Francis is he loved God a lot, and he did some really cool stuff when he was living a long time ago. So Stephen Dillon talked about when Francis was little and when he was growing up, and so we're going to start our story when he's already become a grown-up. And so it says, when Francis grew up, he joined the army. He wanted to be a knight. This was his chance to be strong and brave. But Francis was captured and put in prison, and he was there for a long time. In prison, he thought and thought, what should I do with my life, he asked himself. After that, Francis went home to his family in Assisi. He was sick for a long time, and he kept thinking about what he should do. Should I work in my father's store? Should I have fun with my friends? So he thought and prayed. He knew God would help him decide what to do. A few days later, Francis met a man on the road. The man's hands were wrapped in bandages, and Francis knew the man was a leper. Lepers lived outside the town because they were sick. The man looked very sad and lonely. Francis gave him a hug. Here, take this, he said, and he gave him all the money he had in his pocket. As Francis walked away, he suddenly felt very happy. He felt peaceful. I should help more people, he thought. He walked to the old San Damiano church and knelt down to pray. God, please help me, he said. Soon he heard a whisper, and the voice said, fix my church. Francis looked around the church but did not see anyone. Well, I can fix this old church, said Francis. It needs a few stones here and there. I can do that. So he found some stones and started to fix the old church. He started to live a more simple life. I don't need much, he thought. I need simple clothes and food to eat. And he thought about how Jesus lived long ago. And Jesus didn't need so much either. It turned out people really liked to hear Francis preach. He was kind and cheerful and always smiled. He preached about peace and forgiveness. Be close to God. Look at what he created for us, the sun, the moon, and stars. Look at the flowers, the animals, and birds. It's clear that God loves us so very much. Francis has a message for all of us. Love God, serve God, and be filled with peace and joy. So let's pray to end our time learning about Francis. Dear God, we love you so much. Thank you that we can learn about people like Francis who loved you too. He loved everything you created. Help us to grow close to you in your creation and fill us with your peace and joy. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. You guys can go back to your seats. Our scripture this morning comes from Luke 4, 1 through 13, and Genesis 1, 26 through 31. From Luke. Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, returned from the Jordan and was led by the Spirit in the desert, where for 40 days he was tempted by the devil. He ate nothing during those days, and at the end of them, he was hungry. The devil said to him, If you are the son of God, tell this stone to become bread. Jesus answered, it is written, man does not live on bread alone. The devil led him up to a high place and showed him in an instant all the kingdoms of the world. And he said to him, 
I will give you all of their authority and splendor, for it has been given to me, and I can give it to anyone I want to. So if you worship me, it will be all yours. Jesus answered, It is written, Worship the Lord your God and serve him only. The devil led him to Jerusalem and had him stand on the highest point of the temple. If you are the son of God, he said, throw yourself down from here. For it is written, he will command his angels concerning you to guard you carefully. They will lift you up in their hands so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. Jesus answered, it says, do not put the Lord your God to the test. When the devil had finished all this tempting, he left him until an opportune time. And from Genesis 1, 26 through 31. Then God said, let us make man in our image, in our likeness, and let them rule over the fish of the sea and the birds of the air, over the livestock over all the earth and over all the creatures that move along the ground. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him, male and female, he created them. God blessed them and said to them, be fruitful and increase in number. Fill the earth and subdue it. Rule over the fish of the sea, the birds of the air, and over every living creature that moves on the ground. Then God said, I give you every seed-bearing plant on the face of the whole earth and every tree that has fruit with seed in it. That will be yours for food. And to all the beasts of the earth and all the birds of the air and all the creatures that move on the ground, everything that has breath of life in it, I give every green plant for food. And it was so. God saw all that he made and it was very good. And there was evening and there was morning on the sixth day. morning. Thanks for joining us for worship this morning, whether you're here in person or online. Uh, I really enjoyed my extra hour of sleep last night. Uh, I still managed to get in here about five minutes right before I was supposed to, but uh, I think mostly I needed that sleep because we spent much of yesterday taking down two trees in our front yard. After moving in to the house, uh, we found out that the particular type of trees, some of the larger ones in the front yard, they're very fast growing. Uh, they have troublesome root systems, very extensive. Uh, and in Connecticut, they're actually considered an invasive species. So uh, <laughs> thanks to Charlie and Seth for coming over and helping us out. We were able to get both trees down while avoiding injury while avoiding two power lines, a fence, and two houses. So uh, I'm now looking for advice on how to kill two fairly robust stumps and root systems, known for setting up multiple shoots once cut down. So feel free to find me after the service if you have personal experience and advice on that. Next week, uh, we have a business meeting, and you should have received the annual report this week. Uh, we want as many as possible to participate, so we're going to be having that meeting both in person and via Zoom. I'll be working on getting Zoom set up this week so we can actually interact over Zoom rather than just watching each other. A uh, link for that meeting will be going out later this week. When do, we're into now our sixth week of Tongue Tied. Uh, we started way back in September. Uh, in fact, it was Sunday, September 26th. We've only got a few weeks left. I'm looking forward to next week when we get to hear from Serenity Cologne. Just two weeks after that, we're going to start into our Advent series. And that reminds me, I'm not sure if it's going to be on Monday or Tuesday before Thanksgiving, but we want to do some decorating around here. Uh, around the sanctuary for Advent, and it'd be great to have some help that week. 
Uh, we're heading out of town for Thanksgiving to visit some family up in Bellingham, Washington. So gonna need to try and get that done earlier in the week rather than later. I know it seems way too far off to even think about it, but we're planning to have a candlelight Christmas Eve service here at Zion this year. Now it's gonna be at 5 p.m. More details will come out, but our aim uh, is to have a fairly informal but also personal time for us to come together as a family to sing some carols together, to hear a children's story, and to celebrate the light of Christ. It's one of my favorite services of the year. Whether your home tradition is celebrating on Christmas Eve or Christmas Day, <clears throat> with the service being at five, hopefully you can make it back home around six and get on with whatever your family tradition is. So, <coughs> excuse me. Uh, the Lord be with you. Today's service has to do with sin, temptation, salvation, and creation. A lot of shuns. Again, it boils down to the idea that to regain our ability to talk about faith, we've got to spend some time not just considering topics like sin and evil in the world and, and temptation, but we've got to take the time to listen well, to be honest with ourselves about how we experience these things. <clears throat> we can consider how the world we live in has been impacted by sin and by evil and what salvation looks like both for us as individuals and what restoration for all of creation looks like. Considering the topics, it only makes sense that later this morning we'd celebrate communion together. So, if you've not yet picked up a cup and wafer in the back, they're available. And if you're joining us from home, you can pull something together between now and then. <coughs> Excuse me. Today's passage from Luke is the story of how Jesus was tempted. I should note that I don't think this was the only time Jesus was tempted, or that tempting was an isolated event. Um, though nothing else is really mentioned in Scripture about Jesus specifically being tempted, I doubt this was the only time, just perhaps a significant time. That's why I think this instance was recorded by the Gospel writers in this way. This was recorded, we have this story because of the nature of this temptation. Jesus was tempted in his place of vulnerability. So much like we are. It's no surprise, so let's dig into this scripture just a bit and do our best to understand what's happening. Jesus has just been baptized by John in the Jordan River, and at that baptism, it was this very public and supernatural announcement. Luke says in the chapter just before, chapter 3, that heaven opened. The Holy Spirit came down in Jesus' baptism, and, and it came upon Jesus in bodily form, the form of a dove. And then the heavens opened, and there was this voice that said, You are my Son, whom I dearly love, and you I find happiness. This is one of the few times in scripture where there's direct evidence for the doctrine of the Trinity, direct support. I'll save that for a different Sunday and probably a guest preacher, but back to Luke 4. After the big as life, quite literally, baptism events, Luke says the Spirit led Jesus out to the wilderness where he was tempted for 40 days. Why did the Spirit lead him? We don't know. Why 40 days? Uh, we don't know this for sure either, but the 40 time period has always been significant in the life of the Hebrew people. With Noah and the flood, it rained and poured for 40 days. There's a fun song about that someday we'll get to do. Israel wandered for 40 years times two, not 80 years. I mean, it's 80 years, but when scripture talks about it, they wander for 40 years and then they wander for 40 more. Somehow that number 40 comes to symbolize a type of purification or a, a, a perfect time period. During those 40 days, 
in the wilderness, Jesus ate nothing. It says Jesus was starving, understandable. Then Luke tells us the devil tempted Jesus in three specific ways. The first, turning stones into bread. The second, with giving Jesus all of the kingdoms of the world. And third, that Jesus would jump from the top of the temple and have angels save him. I get the first one. I mean, it, it kind of makes sense. At first glance, the, the second two make it feel like the devil didn't really know what he was doing. Like, the devil didn't plan ahead very well. At least, the devil didn't have a good plan B or C, even. I mean, the, the first one, it makes sense. It hits Jesus right where he's at. No food for, for 40 days. Jesus is vulnerable because he's starving. So the devil tempts him with food. It just makes sense. But when Jesus doesn't give in, it seems like the devil is a total amateur. Okay, get it. The bread thing, he didn't give in. I thought for sure that would do it. I hadn't really planned on Jesus not giving in to that one. But I don't want to lose this opportunity, so I guess I'll throw that all the kingdoms of the world thing at him. It worked on some of the Babylonians. It worked on Caesar and Rome. Maybe it'll work on him. Nope, that didn't work either. Well, maybe he's always secretly wanted to fly like Superman. Nope, guess I blew that one too. It's, it's this story. It kind of makes the devil seem like it's that devil with red tights and horns and a pitchfork and a pointy tail, like the caricature of a devil. But that's our reading of this passage, or maybe my reading of this passage, from my North American individualism perspective. It's, that's what's coming through. We immediately believe the devil is tempting Jesus with Jesus' own individual personal wants and desires. He's hungry, so I'll tempt him with a tasty treat. But there's more going on here. The wilderness area around the Jordan River is like a desert. It's dusty and rocky terrain. It's not like the perfectly flat desert with cracks in the ground. It's not like the great big sand dunes with giant sandworms kind of desert. There's some bushes here and there, but it's mostly dry and dusty terrain with rocks around. And the rocks happen to be about the size of a loaf of bread. And they're all scattered around. See, up until this point, up until this point, Jesus has done nothing as part of his official ministry. He hasn't healed a sick person. He hasn't cast out any demons. He hasn't even preached a sermon yet. Jesus is preparing and considering the ministry ahead of him, and Jesus' role in helping restore the people, helping restore the brokenness. That is what these temptations are about. It's what is to come, what is ahead of Jesus. All of these temptations are about how Jesus will accomplish what, has been, what he has been sent by God to do. So, Jesus is tempted to turn these stones to bread. That's not for the purpose of satisfying his own hunger. I mean, perhaps most immediately, but this is about feeding all the hungry people he's already seen and will come across in his life. All of the stones scattered around him in this desert, there was way too much for him to eat. It's not what this was about. This was about meeting the needs of the people. Jesus grew up in a town called Nazareth. Nazareth was on the wrong side of the tracks. Jesus had, has witnessed people suffering from hunger on a daily basis. People without food and water and everyday necessities. So the temptation is, will Jesus use his power to provide for the daily needs of all the people, and by doing so, gather a following and accomplish what God has sent him to do. So Jesus' reply to the temptation, it, 
makes even more sense. People don't live by bread alone. He's not talking about just himself as an individual. He's talking about all the people he has come to serve. They won't live by bread alone. Jesus has come to accomplish something much more, turning all the stones he was surrounded by into bread to feed the starving multitudes of the earth. It's not going to be enough. Jesus has come to offer life and salvation based on more than having enough food. So people don't live by bread alone. What about all the kingdoms of the world, kingdoms past and present and future? Will Jesus submit to the ruler of this world, the devil, and in doing so have influence over all the people in those kingdoms? This is the political temptation. Jesus has seen the devastation of Rome and its rulers. He knows all about King Herod and the horrendous things that have been done. And then there's the Jewish faction longing for a political leader to free them from Rome's oppression, the Messiah who would return them to their rightful place in the land of Canaan and overthrow Rome. Jesus could make that happen by simply bowing down and worshiping this being in front of him that's tempting him. But Jesus responds, you will worship the Lord your God and serve him only. This was the temptation for Jesus to accomplish the work of salvation through purely political means. The third temptation, flying from the highest point in the temple of the temple in Jerusalem and being saved by the angels, what better proof? What better evidence that he was the son of God and had all power and authority? All those people, because this would have been right above all of the temple courts where all the people mixed and all of those people, they filled the temple courts below him. They would have known without a doubt who he was. All Jerusalem would be saved by his show of supernatural power. This was the military solution. Accomplish salvation by a show of supernatural force that all the hosts of heavens, all the angels with their terrifying flaming swords when they all show up and always have to say, don't be afraid to everyone that sees them. All of those angels are at his beck and call. And yet Jesus responds with, do not put the Lord to the test. So Jesus' temptations, he, he was tempted at his place of strength. He was tempted with what would be his greatest accomplishment, salvation for the people. New Testament scholar Fred Craddock explains it like this. He says, all this is to say that a real temptation is an offer not to fall, but to rise. The tempter in Eden didn't ask, do you want to be as the devil? It was, do you wish to be as God? There's nothing here of debauchery, no self-respecting devil would approach a person with offers of personal, domestic, or social ruin. That's in the small print at the bottom of the temptation. See, Jesus was vulnerable in his place of strength. He was invited to rise. It was perfectly within Jesus's ability to do these things and to accomplish great and wonderful things for all these people he loved. In fact, that was the task he had been given by God. Restore these people, save these people, and that's exactly where he was tempted, to give salvation to the people, but it would not have been true salvation. For that, Jesus would have to wait for another trip to Jerusalem because God's response to human need See, it's different. God's response to human need is salvation, but not on the world's terms. Responding to the needs of humanity is where Jesus was vulnerable. So that's right where temptation came. But what about us? Where's 
our vulnerabilities. I'm not going to go down a list of sins and ways you're tempted because, well, this is where honesty comes in, where our ability to know ourselves, to be honest with ourselves, where that comes in, and even to do a bit of self-reflection. But if this example from Luke has anything to teach us, it's that our greatest temptation will be in an area where we want to do the greatest good, not harm. It'll come in the area of strength. Our temptations and vulnerabilities will be about accomplishing something we know is good, but going about accomplishing that in the wrong way. And so we would do well to remember that following God is always on God's terms not our own, and not on the world's terms. Salvation and restoration, that comes through God's methods, not through our methods or the world's methods. There's an example of this in the Tongue Tied book where the author reflects on something called the Doctrine of Discovery. Doctrine of Discovery was inscribed into US law in the 18th and 19th centuries. This doctrine, blessed colonial powers to seize the lands of indigenous peoples and in the process of taking that land terrorize and massacre indigenous peoples i've seen the evidence of this with my own eyes see while visiting one of california's missions in a school assignment for one of our boys uh, we went and visited a mission called San Juan Bautista. It was on El Camino Real, and El Camino Real is the road that once connected all 21 of California's missions. The churchyard wall along El Camino Real, it had been constructed many times. It was layers upon layers moving higher and higher with years in between each one having different methods of stacking the stones, and the stones made the layers more pronounced. It was constructed that way because the mission had run out of room to bury the dead, so they filled the yard in with more soil over top of what was already there, and then they simply started over, creating multiple layers of wall and earth and the remains of those who died in the process of colonization. See, the doing part was wanting to share about the faith that these people had, but the desire to share their faith had been horribly corrupted by individual greed for land, for power. It allowed the individuals to somehow justify their means. So now we, we long to talk about our faith, must not only do the hard work of seeking repentance for what has been done in the past, but also the work of being honest enough to recognize where we ourselves are vulnerable. But for the grace of God, there go I. The good news is that, like we see in Luke chapter 4, Jesus did not give in to the temptation to provide salvation in some counterfeit kind of way. As a result of what God accomplished through Jesus, salvation is made available. The ultimate need has been addressed, and we have been set free. If we're going to regain our ability to talk about our faith, we're invited to not only take a long, hard look at our vulnerabilities and sin, but we're also invited to participate in the restoration of all creation. Last week, we talked about Genesis, about how Genesis was meant to answer the questions of who made creation and, and why. Even more specifically, the answer those questions, who and why, those made the Hebrew God much different than the gods of all the other cultures at that time. Again, God is redefining the terms, or rather, rejecting our attempts to redefine what God has already established. Genesis invites us to relate to God, to each other, in specific ways. And Genesis invites us to relate 
to all creation in specific ways as well. Genesis 1.28 explains, God blessed them, humanity, and said to them, be fertile and multiply, fill the earth and master it, take charge of the fish of the sea and the birds of the sky and everything crawling on the ground. Tim Mackey puts it this way, and we actually reflected a bit on this in Sunday school this morning, we're commissioned to rule this beautiful world on God's behalf by harnessing all of its potential and creating even more beauty and order. I particularly like how Mackey's words go, harnessing all of its potential and creating even more beauty and order. God invites us into this creation thing that God started and is sustaining. And it's all about relationships. That's how God started it, why God breathes life into humanity and how God invites all humanity to take part in the act of creating more beauty in partnership with God and each other. I got to spend some time appreciating God's beautiful creation this past week. See, for almost five years now, I've tried to, to spend one day a month as a prayer retreat day. I want to be doing ministry for a while, and for me, part of that means taking intentional time each month to get away from my computer and my phone and screens, spending time listening to God. To make this a habit, I usually go on the first Tuesday or Wednesday of the month. This last Wednesday, I spent some time at MacGyver Park. I went on a short hike. I did some reading, journaling, and praying. I stood in the middle of the viewpoint where there's a, a small emblem showing the direction of Mount Hood and Mount Adams and Mount St. Helens. It was a bit of a cloudy day off in the distance, so I could only make, make out Mount St. Helens and Mount Hood, but the beauty of the place was a gift this view right at the bend in the river. There are times like last Wednesday that I seem to be able to pay closer attention to the presence of God. Celtic Christians have a term for this. They, they called these thin places. They're places and times when the veil between God and humanity is, well, thin. That happens to me when I'm out in creation or when I'm in the midst of certain times and pieces of music, when I see certain pieces of art, paying closer attention to such times, cultivating the ability to engage with creation. It's part of what we were made for. It's a major part of learning to talk about our faith. There is beauty all around us and sometimes we miss it. We miss it when we're not paying attention, and that happens. But we have been invited to take part in creation by adding more beauty in order to complement what is already there. That's part of God's invitation in Genesis, and recognizing that helps us regain our fluency to talk about our faith. There are broken systems at work in our world. We are broken people, but God offers restoration. There are times when we experience temptations, when we sin, we participate with these broken systems, when we fall short of what God intended for us. But in the midst of our own vulnerabilities, we know there is repentance. We know there is salvation. Faith talk includes our understanding of how we care for and appreciate all of creation. I'd like to end with a quote included in Tongue Tide. It's from uh, Pastor Megan Good. She writes, Christians are reluctant to talk about God acting in the world. It is confidence that God acts that infuses talk about faith with an energetic joy. 
The broken world is not out there waiting for you to go and save it. It's been saved, and it will be saved by Jesus Christ. We need to get over ourselves and instead focus on the incredible joy of getting to participate in this story together. So this morning, we're going to participate. We're going to participate by celebrating the Lord's Supper together. In this meal, there is acknowledgement of our sin. In this, there is repentance. In this meal, there is salvation. And in this meal, there is an invitation to add to the beauty we have been surrounded by. And all of this is accomplishing and accomplished not on our terms, but on God's terms. So again, if you haven't had the chance yet and you want to grab uh, the cup and wafer, it's available at the back. We're going to, uh, like we've done in the past, go through the hymnal beginning uh, 936. We won't always do it like this with the hymnal, but there's some good stuff in here. So in the purple hymnal 936, In the room just to the left, my left. Take a minute to get more of those available. It's a great time to start peeling back the cellophane layer very carefully. These are convenient, uh, but I'm looking forward to a time when we can celebrate this and have these elements in a different way. But if you haven't already, let's turn to 936 in the hymnal. And we'll read together a couple of these and I'll just direct us along the way. At the table of Christ, we eat this bread and drink this cup. We do this to remember the life and death and resurrection of Jesus, to be united with Christ and with one another as the church, and to look forward to a time when all will be one. As we eat and drink with thanksgiving, Jesus Christ is present with us, and we are empowered by the Spirit to follow Jesus' way of love as the body of Christ, broken and blessed for the life of the world. Friends, as we gather to eat the bread and drink the cup, let us respond with a pledge of love. Will you love God before all things in the power of God's living word and join yourself to God's way? By the grace of God, I will. Will you love and serve our neighbors and lay down your life through the power of Jesus Christ, who laid down his life for us? By the grace of God, I will. Will you support and challenge one another, speak and hear the truth, cease what causes harm to our neighbors, and do good to our enemies? By the grace of God, I will. May the Spirit of God, who calls the church to Christ's supper, give us the grace, strength, and patience to live this pledge of love. Amen. Trusting in God's grace, let us confess our sin. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your steadfast love, for I know my transgressions and my sin is ever before me. Create in me a clean heart. Anyone who is in Christ is a new creation. The old life has gone, a new life has begun. In the name of Jesus, we are forgiven. We are loved and we are free. 
let's skip over to 944. May God be with you and also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to God. Let us give thanks to God. It's good to give thanks and praise. It is a good and joyful thing, always and everywhere, to give thanks to you, Holy One, with all your people on earth and all the company of heaven. We praise your name and join their unending hymn. Holy, 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 God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is the one who comes in your name. Hosanna in the highest. And so we proclaim this mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. We praise you, all holy God, the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, today, tomorrow, and forever. Amen. Amen. And let's uh, continue with the prayer Jesus taught us, the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. The gifts of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, he took the loaf, and when he had given thanks, he broke it, and he said, When you share this bread together, remember me. Take and eat. In the same way, Jesus took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant. When you drink it together, Remember me. Take and drink. And let's continue back in the hymnal with 945 to close our time. In peace, let us pray. Oh God, we give you thanks for uniting us as the body of Christ, and for filling us with joy at this table. Lead us toward the unity of your church, and help us treasure signs of reconciliation. Now that we have tasted the banquet you have prepared for us, may we one day feast together in your heavenly city, through Jesus Christ, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit ever one God, world without end. Amen. Amen. Let's close our time together with a song. We're not going to sing the one that's listed in the bulletin. We're going to sing You Shall Go Out With Joy, 847, in the purple hymnal, number 847, and we'll sing through it twice. You shall go out with joy and be led forth with peace. The mountains and the hills will break forth before. There'll be shouts of joy and all the trees of the field will clap, will clap their hands. And all the trees of the field will clap their hands. The trees of the field will clap their hands. Trees of the field will clap their hands to you go out with joy. Stand up, please. Go out with joy and be led forth with peace. 
The mountains and the hills will break forth before there'll be shouts of joy and all the trees of the field will clap, will clap their hands. And all the trees of the field will clap their hands. The trees of the field will clap their hands. The trees of the field will clap their hands. But you go out with joy. Go out with joy. You're dismissed.